All right. Hi, guys. Happy Friday. Um, welcome to the show for the adventurous wine drinker. Uh, my name is Anu Ivanov, and I'm here with my handsome co-host and husband, Igor Ivanov. We are the owners and founders of Vinus Reverie Wine Merchant out in Walnut Creek, California. And this is our show um, to showcase all of our unique and interesting wines yeah. from around the world, but yeah. um, in particular one today. Which yes. one are we tasting? Uh, this is from Moulineau, uh, very acclaimed winemaker out of South Africa, uh, specifically the Swartland region, which is one of the better wine producing regions uh, uh, down there. So. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, pretty close to uh, Cape Town. It's about 60. Should I do the map? Can, oh, yeah, sure. Let's, let's okay. show it on the map. Yeah, so, here. South Africa right there. So, the Cape is at the bo bottom. I'm going to say Cape Town is like right there. And we're talking about. Give me a second. This light purple, that's Swartland. So, kind of give you the perspective. That's where it is. Okay. Yeah, so that's where it's based out of. Uh, so, this is a, a blend uh, on old, uh, based on old vines. Mm -hmm. uh, and majority of the blend is Chenin Blanc, which is kind of the, the claim to fame grape of uh, South Africa. Yes, yeah. Everybody yeah. knows about Chenin Blanc from South Africa. Or you should, yeah. anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, the birthplace is Loire Valley, most likely. Right. Uh, uh, Vouvray is probably the most famous uh, uh, village within uh, Loire, Loire Valley that grows Chenin Blanc. Uh, here uh, in South Africa, they also call it Steen. S-T-E-E-N. Oh, okay. And it's a uh, Portean. Portean? Is that the correct word? Uh, the grape that's uh, very flexible. So, uh, okay. it covers the whole gamut. You can make the long long lasting uh, sweet wines uh -huh. to very uh, nice mineral uh, dry wines and you know just beautiful sparkling wines so you oh, can okay. make the whole thing it's probably outside of Riesling the most versatile uh, grape in, in the world okay so. yeah quite versatile then all right yeah yeah so uh, like i said Loire and South Africa are the two most famous places uh, and funny enough the uh, Clarksburg in by uh, i think Sacramento uh, actually, is another place that, that makes uh, pretty nice Chenin Blancs. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've not had that. We yeah, yeah, it. it's, yeah. So it's a uh, uh, yeah, great. And, and it's a grape that uh, it's great with terroir. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, and different soils uh, uh, showcase it differently. Uh, for example, a typical, like on granite, typically you get more flinty mineral notes. Versus, versus, versus on clay, you get kind of rounder, richer fruit type of character of, of uh, Shining Blanc. So, it, you know, it's kind of the grape that showcases the, yeah. the soul, just like Riesling. Yes. Terroir. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, give a, a little kind of recommendation, actually. Uh, so, uh, Wine Enthusiast Magazine, they have a really nice podcast covering uh, South African Shining Blanc. So it's uh, uh, Lauren Buzeo, Buze she's one of the editors of Wine Enthusiasts, mm -hmm. and it's episode number 51. So okay. it's about a 30 minute overview, and it's, a, it's actually, if you guys want to kind of get more information about it, that's a cool, uh, uh, you know, cool little podcast okay. to, to check out. Okay. So, so yeah, and so, so we were talking about the Swartland region, uh, so the viticulture in the Swartland region is relatively recent. But the geology is ancient, and I think Anna, you will kind of give us an overview. You did, you did a spectacular view uh, overview when we were doing the Hedges uh, Cabernet out of Red Mountain in Washington State. Yeah, you, you gave a, like a, a history lesson in geology, so I think it'd be fun to kind of give yeah. an overview for Swartland. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah, for sure. I'm not a geologist. Uh, quick disclaimer, but I do like to geek out on yes. this kind of stuff. So yeah. when you were like, "Oh, you got to look at the uh, soil and all that," I'm like, I'll "Absolutely." Have that the wine, well, yeah. yeah, go ahead, pour it. So the vineyard area around Malmberry, um, it has a lot of hills, various altitudes that are comprised of shale. And um, I think, you know, we, we know that terroir, that's like um, the soil and how, what is the impact of the land yeah. on the, the taste of the grape. It's unique. Um, and shale is basically, I'm sure average people don't know this, but it's thin layers of rock. So stratified sedimentary rock that's made of clay, minerals, quartz, calcite, various things. So it's a type of rock. And it, um, when you see pictures of it, it definitely is yeah. very um, memorable. It falls apart, thin layers of rock. And... Shale has something in common with schist and slate. Um, and if you're a wine geek, you know that schist, you know, yeah. also has a, yeah. kind of a, a well-known history of imparting flavors on wine and, and certain wine yeah. regions have you know, yeah. schist as a soil. Yeah. Well, I came across this article by Wayne Belding um, on Wine Review Online, and he wrote um, a really cool article, which I think you should check out. It's called A Tale of Shale mm -hmm. and Schist and Slate. 
how the rock cycle affects the wines we love. Yeah. And I, I thought it was, uh, yeah. if you think that I geek out on yeah. geology, this guy really geeked yeah. out on geology. But yeah. I'm just going to give a, a little bit of a synopsis. So, you know, shale and schist and slate, they all have something in common, other than the fact that yeah. they impart, um, you know, something on wine. And that thing they have in common is that they hold water very well. Yeah. So it's really good water retention for the mm-hmm. grapes. Um, but going back to this region, you know, why is there shale in this area? Um, it, you know, really came into existence in this area because millions of years ago in this area, there were tectonic collisions that kind of um, brought up deep from within the magma of the earth, these um, shale, um, you know, soil became like crystallized into um, granite and then it, you know, all the heat and everything it, it uh, created um, shale as well. So that's why these hills have granite and shale and sandstone in that area because of tectonic activity that occurred millions of years ago. So I just thought it was really cool, um, you know, explanation of, of the soil yeah. going all the way far back in case you wanted to do that kind of geeking out. But yeah. No, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And, you know, kind of uh, to piggyback uh, uh, on the information, uh, me and Kevin Wank did a show, uh, everything you ever wanted to know about wine, but we're afraid to ask. So in episode four of our show, uh, we, we discussed the soil. Yes. And, granite, and, and Kevin gave a spectacular overview about uh, granite soil. Yes. And it's a, a fun episode. It's like an hour long and we just geek out about soil. So it, definitely if you guys want to learn more about uh, how soil impacts uh, these spectacular wines, that's, that's a fun episode to listen to also. You, you can check it out on our Vinus Reverie page. Uh, in one of our you know live shows yeah. that we did, a couple you know, it'd be back. a cool flight, and I'm just thinking of this. Uh, maybe it would be cool to have a flight uh, that is like schist wines yes. or shale, the wines of shale. You know, that would be an interesting uh, look at. Yeah, different so, wines with that. So yeah, uh, we were discussing in uh, previous shows. Uh, we had uh, uh, Languedoc in, in France has some uh, uh, parts where they have like uh, schist soils. We had the Carignan from Sabene. Yeah. And uh, obviously Priorat is one of the most famous uh, 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 regions in the world that also produce schist-based wines. Yes. And, and you know, these are wines that get high acclaim. You know, it, it's uh, there's no secret that uh, uh, a lot of these wines come from special land. Yes. So, so the, uh, they're really concentrated in wine. So... Yeah, and, and yeah, and like you were mentioning, as far as Swartland, you know, uh, besides the soil, the conditions uh, are also great. You, you get uh, short rainfall season. Uh, there's nice breeze from the from the ocean mm-hmm. there, so you know it, it kind of keeps the disease away, and it's it, it's really nice for a lot of Mediterranean based grapes like Grenache and Syrah, which uh, Moulinou will also do, mm-hmm. uh, and, and the Chenin Blanc. So obviously, Chenin Blanc is Loire grape. But, but, you know, it, it excels in those soils, too. Okay, yeah. So, uh, the other aspect of this wine that's actually pretty fun is the um, old vines. Yes. Uh, and, you know, right on cue, uh, uh, two weeks ago, so, I'm gonna, uh, Jessica Robinson had an article on her website. Uh, it's called Save the Stumps. A really cool article about old vines. Uh, and it's free to, for all. Her website is not free uh, on a lot of the articles, but this article is like free. So anybody who goes to her website could uh, read that. And she goes into old vines. And during the article, she actually mentions, uh, she recommends this exact wine uh, 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 for us. But, but more on chances of this wine a little later. So uh, kind of a little overview about old vines. Uh, frequently, anything... The, uh, all the vines that reach age of kind of 25, mm-hmm. they start producing less grapes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, many producers, for economic reasons, start replacing the, uh, uh, the, the wines. Yeah, because, volume. Yeah, you need uh, volume. Uh, but kind of as a general rule, actually, when vines reach the age of um, uh, 35 and older, uh, they actually, they, because they produce uh, less grapes, the grapes are more concentrated and the other great aspects about it is the vines frequently uh, find a perfect harmony with the land mm-hmm. uh, at that stage. So, you mean like dry farming, right? Like yeah. you don't need to, uh, you know, irrigate because exactly. those roots have gone down deep enough. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so the water supply, they, they found the perfect equilibrium with, with the water supply. Right. Uh, so they produce less of fruit, but more concentrated fruit and more uh, fruit that produce more intense flavors. Right. Uh, so, so actually, old vines, it, it's a great thing to have. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, some grapes, like, you know, uh, one of the most famous grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon, you hardly ever see old vines Cabernet Sauvignon. 
because uh, you know either producers in Napa or in Bordeaux they pull them out. Okay. Versus you know some famous ones, uh, Zinfandel is is a famous variety where they typically you know when they reach like eighty years old that's when they produce the most interesting wines. Okay. And Grenache is another wine that's uh, uh, at its best when they uh, are really really old. Mm -hmm. Prior to that age, they need a, a, a blending partner because uh, uh, they uh, they have a lot of fruit, but there's not enough structure to the wine. So, okay. like Petit Syrah is frequently blended, blended with Zin, yes. And Syrah is the natural partner with you know, uh, uh, you know, in in the Southern Rhone. So, right. Grenache Syrah blends are very common because you need Syrah to give it a little uh, structure to to the wine. Okay. So, but uh, uh, something interesting. Uh, uh, is, I, I don't know if uh, a lot of you guys know, uh, the movie Sideways came out in 2004 and uh, uh, that triggered like a whole Pinot Noir craze, you know, the movie kind of uh, uh, makes fun of the Merlot grape mm -hmm. and, and, and praises uh, you know, Pinot Noir. Yes. <laughs> uh, so what happened is that uh, California had a lot of old wines and the reason they had a lot of old wines is because of Prohibition. Uh, so during this 10 year span, there was no need for grapes. So uh, uh, a lot of the farmers were not pulling uh, uh, the vines out. So you had uh, vineyards that, that, had, uh, that came from Italian immigrants who were coming for the gold rush. Right. Who, uh, which, you know, right now they would have been over 100 years old. But because of the craze, uh, a lot of the producers, for economic reasons, started pulling out the old vines and planting Pinot Noir. Yeah. So, you know, that's why right now, yeah. yeah, you have a lot of expensive, uh, underwhelming Pinots in the marketplace. It's because yeah. of that. Saturated marketplace. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, you know, and I actually, I'm like, uh, this is maybe an opportunity for me to, to digress a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm scared. Uh, so, you know, you, know you, you mentioned to me once that, like, uh, what's an expert? An expert, uh, a lot of people think it's somebody who, who has... 10,000, uh, you know, it's uh, debated, but 10,000 hours of dedication to something, to, to the study of something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, if, you know, if I have some uh, wine expertise, I definitely have film expertise, because I, I, I've, re <laughs> I've read and watched a lot of films. You yeah, know, you have yeah. a lot of film critic books, and yeah, you do Yeah, and, and not like, you know, film buff who watches, you know, Star Wars like 30 times or anything like that. <laughs> You know, I'm talking about like, you know, going the all whole, the way, yeah, yeah. D.W. Griffin's, you know, Orson Welles, Jean Renoir, you know, International, uh, the Soviet Montage, German Expressionism, yes. just to kind of give you my resume uh, of kind of knowledge. And so, uh, Alexander Payne made the, the movie Sideways, uh -huh. and you know, we were talking about the craze because people watched the movie and were excited about it, yeah. and it's funny because, you know, the movie to me is mediocre, like as, as a piece of uh, film. Them fighting words. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's that good. Okay. Which is, and I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Alexander Payne, okay. but I do want to, he does, does have one redeeming quality. He he made a masterpiece of political satire called the movie Election. I don't know if you guys ever seen it <laughs> with uh, 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 Reese Witherspoon. I didn't know that he made both. He made both movies. I, I, I know, I know. I, I, and it's what? almost, uh, uh, well, he made other movies, uh, which I think are not that great. Uh -huh. It's almost like, uh, I don't even know how he made Election. Yeah, Election is a great social commentary. It's, yeah. uh, it's you know, on par with uh, some of the great satires of Preston Sturges going back to the 1940s. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we we're really geeking out. But, but, if I could digress again, I know. It's a digression within digression. It's a digression within digression. But here, here's why it's a digression within digression. What do you think is the greatest work of art about digression? Oh, um, I, you know what this is. Pull it up. Uh, yes. I haven't read it, but... Yes, it's Lauren Stearns's The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman. Right. Uh, if you guys, it. it's a... It's a masterpiece of, uh, of literature, and it's the, uh, the greatest novel ever about digression. <laughs> and it's funny enough, they, in, a, in the early 2000s, they made a movie, Tristam Shandy, right. uh, very mediocre. Okay. So, so if you guys want to shortcut it and, and be like, oh, uh, I don't know. The book is better the than the movie. Uh, the movie is a masterpiece. The, the movie, uh, uh, save yourself two hours uh, and, and you know, uh, edit to your book. So, but, but close second, close second is... Uh, um, the great Jonathan Swift. Yes. Of, uh, I read this. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if you read this. Which one? Uh, so uh, Jonathan Swift is I love Jonathan Swift. Gulliver's uh, Travels. Uh, well, thing. also he wrote um, an article. What's that? Well, shorter. It's called. Um, About the Irish. Uh, yeah. She's, uh, a, a modest proposal. A modest it proposal. Was a, yeah, yes. a criticism of, of yeah. uh, 
how poverty was being addressed. But yeah, right. satire. But it's a satire, but it's not a work of digression. He has a book called Tale of the Tub. Okay, I didn't read that one. Yes, and that's, in the, that's like I said, close second. Man, those are two masterpieces that are highly recommended. So, you know, that's a little digression within digression. Okay, how do yeah. we bring it back to wine, though? Well, you know, we, we have to, we have to uh, uh, get, you know, uh, high culture, low culture, and wine all together into, okay. uh, <laughs> into this conversation. But back to old vines. Okay. So, uh, so we talked a little bit of California. So, old vines, you know, just to like a side, uh, side note. So, so this uh, label says old vines on it. Yes. But like uh, uh, the French wines, they say via vignes. Mm -hmm. means old vines. Uh, the German, if you sometimes see it, Alta Reben, that means old vines. Okay. And uh, Vinas Vinejas in Spanish means old vines. Right. So a lot of the labels have that. That means old vines. Yeah, so, like, so, yeah but the, the only thing is there's no actual um, uh, uh, high, you know, definition of like what old vine is. Is it 35 and older? Is, it, uh, uh, is this 80 and older? There's no difference. Uh, so it's very loosely used uh, most of the time. Yeah, well, it should definitely, <laughs> yeah, there should be some sort of standardization perhaps. Yeah. But, but you know, uh, what's interesting about old vines is uh, 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 Bolivia and Chile, funny enough, uh, uh, have some of the oldest uh, vines in the world. Uh, some of them have over 200 years old. Really? Yes. Yeah. I would not have thought that those um, those areas have very old wine regions. I mean, I thought Georgia and uh, oh, oh well, uh, uh, they're, they're not known for for producing uh, like you know renowned wine. I mean, Chile is trying to break it in, into the field mm -hmm. uh, and believe it, you know makes wine, but it's not like in the international marketplace. Right. Uh, but but you know that doesn't mean that they don't have old vines. Oh, okay. So oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, the other fun part is. Uh, Actually, something much closer to home, the, um, what did I have, Evan, Evangelo Vineyard in Contra Costa County uh, okay. has 140-year-old Carignan uh, vineyards, okay. which are the oldest Carignan grapes in the world. Right here. Right in here in Contra, Contra Costa County. County, yes. And I frequently noticed uh, wines that come from, from that vineyard get very uh, high praise. So, okay. so, so it's a vineyard that obviously produces great fruit. Uh, uh, for, Something for to check out then. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, it, this is this is fun stuff. Yeah. Um. And, and but back to South Africa and old wines. Uh, South Africa, funny enough. Uh. So uh, you know, kind of trying back to California. So because of that uh, uh, craze, uh, a lot of the people in the wine industry were kind of upset that all these old treasures were being pulled out. Right. So they actually formed a heritage society to basically say, hey, uh, they encouraged owners to uh, preserve their vines, right. older vines, especially if they're 50 years and older. Right. So that was kind of like the, you know... Effort to kind of stop it. Yeah, the stop the, the, yeah, the, the economic craze of the uh, sideways. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, I, the reason I know, uh, basically uh, uh, what I've said is that a popular mediocre movie triggered uh, a reaction of making popular mediocre wines. That, right, because that's people, current, yeah, yeah. people watch the movie and yeah. then they base their um, consumerism I, on that. Yeah, and, and uh, I guess what I try to relate is uh, a lot of these Pinot Noirs, they make really mediocre wines, but their popularity escalated the price. Whereas those old wines were not triggering high prices so you were getting better quality wine from all the uh, 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 you know uh, vineyards at a cheaper price point right so so it's like you see economic the consumer got got shafted <laughs> right yeah well sense. wine as a yeah. commodity versus a yeah. craft product yes I yes think. yeah yeah so so you're just uh, you know a part of it and uh, frequently you have the the old bush vines you you can see them they look like a little stump mm -hmm. and, and, and they become wider as they become older and it's because you know the roots are kind of just digging into yeah. the ground, yeah, yeah. So, so that's uh, that's a little fun stuff. Okay. All right. So now, just uh, I, I think we could end it up with a little bit of uh, tasting notes, right? Yeah, for, and um, uh, Moulinou Winery. So, uh, do you want to do tasting notes, and then I'll just maybe yeah, let me do the tasting notes. Around. Let's talk about it. So, this wine is super highly rated, ninety three points decanter, seventeen and a half out of twenty chances. It's yes. Super high score. Yes. Um, and I just thought it was really, um, really delicious. It smells amazing. Um, the tasting notes I wrote down were cloves, uh, pears, kind of like a bright gooseberry and, um, like a mineral waxy almond, just very delicious. Mm. I love the waxy yeah. almond finish. Um, it's very nice. And you know, uh, let me, uh, let me give some uh, details behind the while I'll, I'll, I'll kind of read it off. So like I said, it was a blend. So 65% Chenin Blanc, 13% Grenache Blanc, 
10% Viognier, 10% Claret, uh, which is a Southern uh, Rome grape, and Semillon Gris. Very cool. And it came from different vineyards. So, so this is kind sustainably of... Sustainably farmed vineyards. Yeah. Sustainably farmed, yeah. And this is what you were talking about, like different soils. So uh, the Chenin Blanc are 38 years old uh, and uh, Grenache Blanc is 80 years old. And they came from schist, uh, yes. schist soils. Then um, sh uh, the Claret and Semillon uh, came from decomposed granite. Yes. And Viognier came from iron-rich soils. Oh so my. you get a lot of different profiles in this blend. So right. it's, it's, it's not only different grapes, but different grapes grown on uh, different, different areas, soils. Yeah, yes. Different types of rocks. Yeah. So uh, uh, pretty nice. And you know, uh, the other thing uh, I want to point out, so you know, uh, we adore Jensis and, and you know, kind of everything that she recommends. Her, I mean, first of all, her articles are very interesting and, and fun to read. Yes. So. Yeah, I think she's very informative. I, I, she's, you know, she's the best teacher uh, of wine that I came across. Yes. So, uh, but uh, 70 and a half points, you know, a lot of people say, what, what the hell does that even mean? You know, is that like out of 100? <laughs> <laughs> no, so 70 yeah. and a half points to me, I would roughly say it's like 93 points on the 100 point scale. Right. Uh, but, but she's very frugal. With right. Her. Yeah, like she doesn't very, hand them out, you know, yeah. very and, often. Yeah, if, if you kind of follow a, a wine criticism, uh, many critics are not frugal. They actually like over uh, hype uh, the wines. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to context, you know, we sell this wine for $33, which is, you know, it's not a, a, a cheap wine. But here's kind of... Uh, it's not that expensive, though, when you look at uh, California well, wine pricing, I'll say that. Well, let me tell you this way. There's no $33 California Chardonnay that Justin Robinson gave 17 and a half points to. Yep. Just to give you a context, not, not a single one. Yeah. So, so that's just a, a context. So, and this is a rich wine, actually. Yeah. I, I want to say that it's, it's a very, um, yeah, it's so, a heavy, but it's a, it's a rich white wine. Right. So, so it's, that's why I mentioned uh, uh, it would be more in the Chardonnay spectrum yeah. versus the Sauvignon Blanc yeah, spectrum, which are the, kind of the two white grapes that Californians mostly drink. Right. So, so I think that if you know, uh, this is uh, if you drink Chardonnay and want to try something interesting, um, this is a good one. I mean, this oh, this is a spectacular, spectacular one. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine you would be disappointed at all. Yeah, and just uh, the fruits and, uh, and the richness and uh, kind of the mineral backbone. Yeah. Minerality here is definitely more than uh, like typical California wine. Yeah, like this would go great with California cuisine, like yeah. salmon, you know, yeah. chicken, anything like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, very flexible. We were saying uh, it's, a, it's a versatile grape. Yeah. I mean, right there with these things, so. Cool. Well, do you want to tell us a little bit about the winery? Yes, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, very cool stuff. So let's end it on that. So Moulinou uh, Family Wines. Uh, it's, uh, it started by Chris and Andrea Moulinou in 2007. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, Andrea Moulinou, uh, she graduated from UC Davis. Oh, did you know her? <laughs> I, I might have went to school with her at the same time. So, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but the accolades are just unbelievable. Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, Platters, is, it's a South African wine guide. It's kind of, I think it's their, uh, kind of most kind of red, uh, mm -hmm. wine we got okay. in the magazine. Yeah. So he was uh, awarded, uh, uh, five star ratings, uh, 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 yeah. So he was, they named it winery of the year four times, which no other winery has ever got that. Right. In, uh. 14, 16, 19, and 20. Right. Uh, uh, Andrea was named as Wine Enthusiast 2016 International Winemaker of the Year. Yes, very big. And uh, Tim Atkins, he's, a, he's a, a, a wine specialist who covers mostly South African wines. Uh, he called her the, uh, the winemaker of the year too. Okay. So, you know. Women in wine. Women in wine. Yeah. And, and, and the accolades are just unbelievable. You know, just to go apart, you know, for the high score from, from Genesis. Yes. And, and yeah, so this is uh, it, this is not not even considered their like top end wines. Right. They, they make you know spectacular Syrahs uh -huh. uh, uh, on par with uh, Northern Rhone. You're okay. talking about Cote Roti, uh, uh, Hermitage level. Wow. Yeah, and they have higher end uh, uh, you know um, single vi uh, like single vineyard, single variety Chenin Blancs too. Okay. So, so this is kind of uh, uh, their medium level uh, wines. Okay. So, so yeah, and, and the scores are spectacular. So that's just a, yeah, just great wine, cool backstory, old vines. Yeah, uh, digressions. Lauren, yeah, Lauren Stern, you know, <laughs> everyone else need any film criticism. Well, uh, you need this wine, that's for sure. It's delicious, yeah, yeah, so yeah. awesome. All right, thanks guys for joining us. Uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, you know, if you have questions or comments, yeah. definitely 
uh, give us a shout and uh, join us next Friday for our next wine tasting review show. Yeah, I mean, hey, if you guys know uh, friends who, who might geek out with us, let them know about uh, our, our channel and, uh, you know, forward it to them. And, uh, you know, please join us next yeah. time too. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Take, Take care, care and, and uh, drink different. Bye. Bye.